um, to today's session. It's really, the session's all about the groups across the region who, through a lot of hard work, inspiration and perspiration, have started to make projects happen. They're at different stages, with some groups having been on the journey for a number of years and others really only quite recently formed, and they represent a number of different delivery models. We're also really pleased to have a festival keynote speech from Charlie Luxton. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Charlie. Charlie is a TV presenter on shows such as Building the Dream and Best Laid Plans, and is the director of Charlie Luxton Design. He's a passionate advocate for self-build, sustainable housing and community-led approaches. He's based in Hook Norton in North Oxfordshire and is the designer for the Hook Norton CLT project on a scheme moving towards the construction stage now. So over to you, Charlie. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? I'm hoping you can. Excellent. I'll share my screen and I'm, I'm trying to get through far too many slides because I always get a bit overexcited. Uh, so without further ado, I'll, I'll get going. So I'm going to talk to you about a project in our village called Hooky Housing uh, or, or Hook Norton Community Land Trust. And it really grew, I think, out of a low carbon group in the village, which had been doing things like lending money to people at low interest rates to do sustainable refurbishments, PV, uh, electric cars, all this kind of stuff, because we were very fortunate to get some funding from the government about 10 years ago, which we've used to invest into projects to then get a rolling sort of fund back into the community. And, and so as a group, we went around and asked the village what we should look at next, having had a refurbishment fund and looked at all these transport and all these various other initiatives. And much to our sort of surprise, people said housing. And the reason I say to our surprise, because as a village of 700 houses, we've had about 160 new houses uh, in the last five to seven years. And despite that, people in the village were still open to new housing if it represented the kind of houses that they actually wanted and needed, which is sort of a, a kind of a crushing indictment of the state of developer-led housing. Uh, so the other thing about developer-led housing, which I tend to start these kind of chats about, is there's is an extraordinary statistic that if you ask people whether they would like to live in a new house, a new built, brand new house, 74% of people say no. So we have a hugely dysfunctional uh, industry right at the very heart of our uh, society that is called mass volume house building. And I think part of the reason people are not interested in it is it just isn't very fair. And by that, I mean that when house building occurs, one person gets, uh, you know, arguably millions of pounds and the rest of the community sort of suffers quite often in that you get slower uh, broadband, more traffic, longer waits at the dentist, the doctor, etc. And there's no real benefit. I think one of the great things about traditional house delivery was that it benefited your community in some way, like you might have known someone who worked as a carpenter or it might have been a neighbor's cousin's house, but all of those kind of local enmeshing things seems to have been stripped away. To the point that of the uh, 160 houses that have been built in our village, considering I run an architecture practice in the village and I know a lot of builders and contractors and what have you, I don't know a single person who has worked on any one of those houses. So all of the pay and all of the profit, well, all the profit's gone to three landowners and all of the money earned during the construction has ended probably going up and down the M40 in a white van. And that is a problem. And then we wonder why people don't want new housing. So we were very, very lucky in that we um, were able to identify a site. Having been asked to look at new housing, we were, uh, we were able to identify a site in the village owned by Chowell Council, which you can see here in red on the edge of the, the community, on the edge of the village there. It's a sort of scrubby bit of land left over after planning. There was a sort of a 1930s housing estate around here. And there was this kind of bit of land next to the sports and social club, which whilst having problems was, was available. Uh, and so we approached the council uh, a few years ago, actually with Fiona, when Fiona was actually with the council. And when Taylor Wimpy did this housing estate, they left a road that took us to the edge of the site. Uh, we then approached Taylor Wimpy and they agreed that if it was a community led housing project, they would transfer the ransom strip 
to us for a, a peppercorn uh, amount, actually, uh, you know, it just literally covered their legal fees, which was incredibly uh, good. So we had a site and we had a community and we had demand. So what were the, the next steps? We were, we were very lucky in that we had the potential for some initial funding because of the low carbon group had some resources to get it going, which, as I think many of you will know, that's the hardest thing to, to, to sort of get that first bit of funding. And we started by uh, looking around at the village and trying to understand why the new housing that was being built sort of failed, I think, to meet the demands of the people. And one of the things about it is that it's quite an urban sort of grain. There's a sort of a density to the village, which everyone really likes. And all of the new housing estates that have been built look exactly like all of the the other housing states built anywhere in Britain, apart from the fact they've got this rather uh, unusual local stone. Uh, other than that, they've got nothing to do with Hook Norton whatsoever. So we started to talk in depth with the community, first of all, sort of February 2018. And we went through a very long process. And I think this is where this idea of fairness comes into it, is we went through a long process of asking repeatedly asking the community what they wanted and how they wanted it to be developed and how they wanted it to look and what things they wanted in it. And I think that process was hugely important because as we went through it, you can see the kind of repeat events that we have. I mean, I think we ended up with about sort of 18 times that we sort of reached out and got responses and worked with the community. Down to, as you can see on the top there, I hope that image might make some sense, like working out the layout of the actual estate and it's really interesting is that when you ask people that are going to live somewhere what they want it is not the same as the thing that developers deliver so we offered a scheme which was lots of little boxes sat on their own little garden with a little front garden a little back garden a little garage and the people were like no we don't want that if we're going to live there we are interested and engaged with larger communal land uh, shared gardens we really like the idea of parking yards with all the cars kept away from the housing. We really like the idea of deep, deep ingrained sustainability um, and, and many, many other factors that came out of it. And so you end up uh, with a design that, you know, the whole community could really coalesce around, I think. And as a result, when we went to planning, I think we had one uh, slightly awkward member who was against it, but even people who live next store and originally were kind of like well, that's new houses right on my doorstep I think working with them we got around all of these concerns and um, you know we've, we've documented this journey uh, to a rather lovely sort of graphic that sort of starts and I'm sure this can be made available starts to sort of pick up on all the ideas that that, that, that kind of came through in those conversations and this is basically the, the master plan of, of the scheme as you can see there's a parking yard at the top corner here for many reasons it's there to do with sports and social club and, and a mugger one block called the South Terrace of th two, three and two one bed houses and then eight two bed flats here and then a community building and crucially a green, a village green, a shared village space for events and, and locations. And despite Hookie being a large village, it doesn't really have per se a, a village green at the moment. The very heart of the village is a graveyard. Uh, which sort of gives it a slightly dead heart. It looks quite nice, but there's nowhere for people to gather. And that's what we're trying to provide. And these are the kind of houses that we're looking to build. Um, and we, 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 can't, we had conversations right down to form of roof, um, you know, the way roofs ran, the kind of thermal performance, et cetera. And I think that meant that people really bought into the ambitions of the project. And you can see on your left there is, a, is a, the community building which is going to be a sort of a community space come cafe. And one of the ideas we had was in order for people to be comfortable moving into smaller houses, we have got two very nice little one bed or masonette one bed little sort of a flats, if you like, studio flats for people to rent. So rather than having a bedroom empty uh, 360 days of the year, you have no bedroom and you can, you get five or 10 days a year in this, in this other space. And we also looked at workshop spaces and, and, and flexible space. It can be workshop spaces or, or, or home, you know, um, sort of we work kind of office rental space. Uh, and this is the kind of idea for the inside of the cafe. We have got community buildings around the village. And the problem is they're very cold and hard to heat and, you know, not deeply sort of sustainable. And we figured that, that there was an alternative here that we could provide. And also the scale of the space was much more about a living room, if you like, in the village rather than a hall. Um, 
and you get a sense here of how that community building uh, works. Um, and then behind this was a deep sort of commitment to sustainability. And within that, looking to generate all of our own energy using solar panels um, with the potential for growing food, for charging electric cars, to actually house some of our electric car club by the buildings to be charged by the, by the solar panels on the roof. Um, and uh, district, an element of district heating between the schemes, although because they're passive house, there's very little heating required. And um, actually the, through the design process, we, 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 we've gone through passive house certification and that's a, a system whereby you design the houses with incredibly thick insulation and air tightness, mechanical ventilation, heat recovery. And you see that our heat demand, uh, our, our heat demand is 15 kilowatts uh, per square meter per year, which means that they're passive equivalent. But on top of that, we are generating quite a lot of electricity. And you can see that the blue line there is the PV yield and the, and the, 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 the moving dots there are, are around space heating and hot water and general electrical use. And actually we're gonna be um, exporting six and a half ish, 6,200 kilowatts per meter square per annum. So we're passive house plus, we're actually generating electricity after occupation rather than using it, which given we have a massive challenge of getting rid of 30% uh, of our CO2 emissions from housing by 2035-ish, you know, this is a small step in the right direction. Now, the other thing that we have really focused on in, in build is once you've got the energy consumption and you've designed a beautiful space to live and where we've got um, uh, lifetime homes on the ground floor flats and very high, you know, good space standards on the rest of the flats, um, Four of the flats are for sale at market uh, value to help subsidize the rest of the scheme. And the other schemes, three are at affordable uh, rent and the other eight are at uh, the 80% of market rate. Um, once you've, you've, you've built uh, a build, once you're running a building incredibly low energy, low energy, the big issue becomes embodied energy. And that's the energy that it takes to construct the buildings. And if you look, this graph kind of sums it up quite neatly. If you have, a, this is a life cycle energy consumption of a, of, a, of, a, of a building, typical building. You can see embodied energy is not, you know, it's not the biggest part of the pie, but as you push towards a very low energy building, the embodied energy of a standard construction becomes an increasingly large part of that, that, that pie. And so you need to drive that down. So we have done a whole series of uh, CO2 modeling for the building. We're using timber construction, timber insulation, uh, wood fiber insulation, a lot of recycled materials. And we started off at 408, uh, 628 tons of CO2. And then just through careful specification and careful thinking about what it is we're gonna use in the building, we got that, we got over 200 tons of CO2 out of the construction process. So it's kind of like the next sort of level of once you've got your energy consumption in, in occupation down, you really need to drive down your embodied energy. Um, so the next big question, and I'm, I'm, I'm conscious my time is up, but the next big question for us is how to build. And, and we're in that process now of the difficult conversations around cost. Uh, cost optimization, I think we'll call it, or value engineering. But also one of the things we're very keen on is trying to maximize as much local labor as possible in the construction. Because if we just get a big contractor and white vans driving 50 miles there and back to site every day, we've kind of failed at that very, one of those initial ideas, which was yes, provide the housing that everyone needs, but also trying to shift that debate to being about there is real benefit to this housing, to the community, not just the people who live there, not just about the facilities that you create, but also about the employment uh, and the investment into the local economy. So there's kind of like a number of elements that we're trying to tackle uh, and it's not easy. It's been very, very challenging. I, I am confident we will get there, but I think there's gonna be some hard yards and heavy lifting to do between now and, and handing over keys. Uh, and I'm sure, uh, yeah, that, that's kind of, uh, that, that's my time. So I hope that was of, of interest. Thanks very much, Charlie. That was uh, really um, a really inspirational start for us, I think. Um, you did have a little bit more time, actually, but have you finished? You're right. Yes, no, I mean, I, think I, I can always <laughs> go on. I can go on for days if that's what you'd like, but I'm sure no one wants to. Someone's asked a very good question. Who are the people that wanted housing? 
one of the things that we have specified and we have had long and detailed conversations, I'll put it that way, with Chirwell Council and the, and the housing department is that we wanted uh, priority to local residents. Um, and partly because we've had a lot of affordable housing in the village and it's all gone to people on the general housing list in Cherwell. And what's been very interesting about that is we went out to the community and said, um, we asked them questions about their income, we anonymized it, but, and we realized that there were about, out of the kind of 50 odd, 55 people that expressed a very keen interest in the project, probably about half of them could be on the housing list. Four of them were on the housing list. And when we said to them, why don't you go on the housing list? They were like, I don't want to be on the housing list. You know, I've got an income. I don't need to be on the housing list. And the people at Cherwell could not get their heads around the fact that some people just don't want to go on the housing list. And so we, we've tried to construct a sort of back to back list where our list sort of covers all of their questions and gets people with local connection and who would get the housing if they went on the list into the housing. But unfortunately, that doesn't deal with Cherwell's housing list. It's very complicated. And, and uh, I think something we really need to think about, that there is just a, a real disconnect between what people feel kind of... Per I, I think a combined household income, if I'm right, and you might be correct me if you're not, I think it's something like £80,000, and you can be on the housing it's, list. Yeah, yeah. So it's a huge amount. But I don't think anyone knows that. And so we've really struggled to, to try and uh, get Cherwell to accept that we need local... We want local people in this housing because... None of local people have really got the houses that have been built in the affordable section. Uh, so that, that's a complicated, um, yeah, a complicated equation to try and quack, crack. Thanks very much. Um, I think what we'll do, if it's okay, is um, we will, and I see there's quite a few questions coming in through the chat, but I think what we'll do is we will take those at the end because I think other groups will also want to respond to those as well. Um, so I don't know whether Charlie's able to stay right the way through. We have got somebody else from Hook Norton Community Land Trust here as well, Cathy Ryan, who may be able to pick up um, some of the questions from Hook Norton's that are specifically around Hook Norton, if that would be all right, Cathy, if Charlie has to leave. Um, just before, we, we are going to move on now to our panel of speakers um, from groups around the region, but just before we do, just to find out a little bit where the audience is coming from. We've got a poll that we were going to put up. Um, just to ask you really what your, what interests you most about community-led housing, and then we'll try and um, gear the discussion a little bit towards that. So if you'd like to make a response, we'll give you a few moments. Thank you very much. So I might need to put my glasses on for this bit. So, so really, yeah, it seems like the majority of people here are primarily interested in what is really truly affordable housing. Um, so a number of our groups are providing definitely affordable housing, but there's a, I think there's a real issue around what that means, as, as Charlie's alluded to. And uh, the second most is being part of a strong community, which I think is really, uh, really interesting um especially given the sort of times that we live in and what we've been through which we'll now move on to our other speakers um firstly i'd like to introduce zareen jacob from oxfordshire orchard homes zareen hi can everyone hear me okay great all right so my name is zareen i'm speaking here as a group member of OOH or O, Oxfordshire Orchard Homes, and we are a small newly formed emergent group centered on the sort of West Oxfordshire area. I'll briefly outline our guiding principles and key values which were distilled early on when we came together. I've clumped them into three areas just for ease. Uh, Diversity, being diverse, intergenerational, inclusive in what we do, how we approach things, and self-build with a focus on affordable homes, eco-friendly and built to environmentally high standards. And then finally, to really engage in forming those strong partnerships that are essential with the myriad of experts and all, all the you know, various parties. So at the moment, we are further refining our purpose and also deciding on what kind of a structure we want. What we've done is been through our training with our lovely hub, 
set up various social media things like email, Twitter, Facebook, and reached out to a couple of parties on the landowner and developer side. We've also created a rather nice provocative list of questions to individually answer as a precursor to clarifying our vision and purpose. If we see it as a living document, you know, we're happy to share it with people. You can tweak it to suit. And we meet regularly as a group, especially when things need doing and deciding. In terms of how we work, our roles have sort of evolved organically using our collective skills and knowledge and interests, kind of finding our feet with sociocratic methods and collaborating well, no major conflicts. We've certainly had divergent opinions that we've reconciled. And I know we have some of our group members here. There's Linda and Morris and Sophia. You can at least wave so people know you. And um, that's really all I had to say. We were looking forward to learning from the more experienced groups who've been through that difficult journey. Thanks. Thanks very much, Serena. We're not moving time. Thank you. Um, so we'll move on now with no, no further pause to Fran Ryan from Oxford Community Land Trust. Fran. I, is it possible to share, for me to share some pictures, Fiona, please? Um, so I'm going to talk about Oxfordshire Community Land Trust and... Um, you should be fine to share, Fran. You should be set up to share. So okay, can... all right. Let me just see if I can do that. See that? That's great. We can all okay. see that. Living. Okay. So um, it's sort of a different story to the one that Charlie has just told, um, which is that, you know, it's been actually quite a prickly path for us. Um, getting the land took a very long time. Um, and Oxfordshire Community Land Trust, first of all, is, um, was set up in 2003, um, but registered in 2006. And the idea of a land trust really is to take land out of the market and hold it in trust. Um, land is why, the cost of land is why houses are so expensive. And so the idea of the land trust, which really started um, in this country to gain traction with a report from Pat Pat Conaty of the New Economics Foundation. Um, and the idea there was take land out of the, the speculative market, but also mutual home ownership was an idea that was very much part of that at that point. And the idea there is that you don't own the house, you own a share in the housing that's built on the land. And that was the idea that started us off in the beginning because we were really focused on trying to make, make housing genuinely affordable but also permanently affordable. Now the idea of mutual home ownership has turned out to be an incredibly difficult one and the one uh, the only place that's done it thus far is the wonderful Lilac co-housing in Leeds which I'm sure all of you know about and the really interesting thing about Lilac is that actually nobody owns their own house they own a share in the house and the shares are not linked to, to the housing market they're linked to the local employment index so it's a really incredible model if you don't know it, um, but not one that, that we've been able to make work in Oxford. Um, Oxfordshire Community Land Trust then got a tiny piece of land, a, a backland development. So here's the, this is the, this is Dean Court, this is the Antrim Road, tiny little bit of land behind two former council houses, which we managed to buy in 2012. Um, and we, we got planning permission shortly after that, but then we hit some problems, um, which took a number of years to overcome. Um, and eventually we, uh, we, got, uh, we had to apply for planning again uh, because the planning ran out. And these are not quite passive houses, but almost passive house. Um, and th this design got through planning a couple of years ago and we have now just received funding for it. Um, and we will start being on site later in the year once we have become a registered provider. So the land trust, it's community led, but it's essentially a group of people looking, you know, working to provide housing for other people. It's not um, kind of like co-housing where you're providing homes for yourselves. So um, this is, it, I guess the model is more similar to the, um, to the Hook Norton one than it is to uh, what Zareen's just described. 
And just on, on the way to getting to, to, the, to the Dean Court project, we also made a bid for the Wolf Cop, uh, the Wolf Cop paper mill site. And this, of course, went to Carla Holmes, as I'm sure all of you know, but um, the community vision for that um, was very much um, similar to what Charlie's described in Hook Norton, clusters of houses around greens. We also had some floating homes, which I don't think Carla have put in, and much, much higher density than Carla would have, ha would have, uh, have in fact put in, and far fewer uh, far fewer cars as well. So that design, that went down very well with the local community. This is a packed meeting that we had around that time. Um, and in fact, we, we started, we needed to raise money very quickly to actually take it forward had we won the bid. And we raised 500, promises of 500,000 pounds in a week. So there's a massive interest out there um, in community-led housing as we demonstrated that, at that point. Um, I'm just going to go to the next one. We also made put in a bid for the Irving building, which is an old school building in uh, in East Oxford. And on this occasion, we were we were pipped to the post by another local um, church who had slightly deeper pockets than the land trust. I mean, money to buy land is always the issue. Um, we would have, you know, built a. Um, a um, some affordable terraces and flats and also some community buildings and the focus also was on having fewer cars, cars on the edge, all of those things that you become familiar with. Um, just in summary really the you know in terms of how you know where we're going now um, the focus is really on trying to figure out where to get land. It's incredibly difficult anywhere in the southeast um, getting land for free or very cheap is is obviously the best, but at the very least, we've decided that we won't bid on the open market for land anymore. It's so expensive and virtually impossible. Um, we also think it's a, another defining characteristic of Oxford Community Land Trust is in, uh, ensuring affordability and perpetuity. So no right to buy, and as far as possible, where even people where where people have shared ownership no right to staircase up to 100%. As soon as that house becomes a market home, it's no longer affordable. And that's a, probably a defining characteristic of OCLT. Um, and, it, you know, we also, we need to get better at quantifying and pre presenting the benefits of community-led housing. I think, um, you know, that some of the stuff that Charlie's just presented is a real help with that, but we all need to get better at doing it for our own projects as well. Um, developing a relationship with partners, Zareen is, is already onto this. Um, it took us a while to realize that actually that was a really, it was a great shortcut to, to kind of finding um, access to expertise that we didn't have. And of course, um, promoting what we've done, what's happened so far, Stonesfield Community Trust, who I don't think are here today, but they've been around for a while. They've really led the way. Um, lilac and kindling. Um, I think Alice is going to talk about that a bit later, but the wonderful, there are some fantastic um, examples of what's been done locally and, um, you know, we need to get better at presenting them so people actually know what's possible. And I, what I didn't know is what Charlie's just said too about the possibility of people getting onto the housing list. So I'm going to add that to my, you know, to my list of things that we should be making more of. That's it really for me. So thank you. Thank you very much, Fran. Uh, so we're now going to move on to Sarah Westcott, who is from Oxford Co-Housing. Sarah. Thank you. Um, well, a lot of it's been said already, but I will very quickly, as fast as I can, talk about Oxford Co-Housing. Fran, uh, that you've just heard of, everybody is really our original founder, Shaker Mover. Um, so Oxford Co-Housing aims to build between 20 and 40 households in a co-housing scheme within the Oxford Ring Road. So those are our parameters. It's quite important um, that, that that's what they are. We, we decided that some years ago. We've been going about 12 years. 
Um, it's been a long old haul and we're not the first co-housing group in Oxford to do that, to, to have a go. Um, the strap line of co-housing is intentional neighbourhood. So I'll just share with you um, a, a picture, a sort of graphic of an intentional neighbourhood. There you go. Um, it's a lot of features that have already been mentioned by Charlie. Um, this is to do with um, building the idea of a co-housing scheme is that the members, the residents design and live and manage the scheme and the houses would be built or flats or terraces or whatever they are mixture would be built around a common area a common uh, safe place there would be a uh, transport uh, cars and so on outside of the central area there would be a common house here it is in the front in which there would be a, co a kitchen where meals would be shared a number of times a week depending on people's choices um, there might be workshops there'd be guest bedrooms one of the ideas of co-housing is that you downsize from your where you live now so we because we, a lot of us have spare bedrooms that are hardly ever used you downsize but there are guest bedrooms scattered about um, the uh, the place. Um, energy would be an important feature, low cost, uh, low carbon footprint as uh, we have been through the passive house discussions as well as Charlie has mentioned, um, uh, maybe ways of doing community heating as, as shown here, um, regular meetings of the residents that would be part of the requirement if you like, you're a member because that's what you want to do, you want to be part of managing the whole scheme, there could be gardens, private gardens behind the houses, um, uh, shared allotments and so on. So it has a lot of the features that Charlie mentioned. Um, nothing, nothing surprising there, um, I would say. Um, one of our, um, so I think the, the difference that I'm sensing is that um, we are a membership organisation. So we actually choose, to, uh, we, ha we are members, uh, people join up, they sign up because they agree with what we're trying to do and they want to be part of it. And um, currently we ha we've been going for about 12 years. Um, and it's a long old hall and currently we have about uh, we have 10 full members and 10 associate members if you go on our website you can see the definition what the difference is between those two categories we think people need to spend a bit of time getting to know us before they become full members and we accept them as it weren't a full membership but I get the, the importance for co-housing is that we've worked together um, to make this thing happen and we will have worked together for some time of course members have come and gone we do have um, uh, hope to have an intergenerational um, scheme um, and a mixed tenure scheme. We are obliged by Oxford City Council to have 50% affordable housing and 50% in their definition is 40% uh, people from the housing list uh, and 10% of um, shared ownership. Um, we've, all, we've been trying to push for a third, a third, a third um, in order that we uh, can bring in people in the middle income or middle range as it were, um, our, uh, people who can't afford to buy a whole house but might be able to part by. We are very keen on affordability and maintaining affordability and we've toyed with becoming a land trust, Fran knows all about that and has explained that, in order that we can lock in affordability. We haven't uh, done that yet but that is a, uh, a thought we've had about how do we how do we maintain the affordability of um, the 50 percent of the site or hopefully in our case 66 percent of the site which are affordable homes um, we have put in two bids Fran has mentioned one of them we were part of a bid for Wolvercote um, we didn't get it and we were part of a bid for Stansfeld um, outdoor education centre on the edge of Headington. Um, both times we lost out to other other people in, in the case of Carla, they're a big development company and in the case of Stanfeld, a local Oxford, a Oxford charity, but they both had money to put down on the table in an unconditional bid and we can't do that. We need to get planning permission before we're going to be able to go to banks like Triodos and so on and borrow money, large sums of money to fund the scheme. So we've ne we can't outcompete um, an unconditional bid. So we've been unsuccessful. What I would say has changed in the 12 years I've been involved in co-housing is that there's been quite a change in um, 
in credibility about co-housing go on the national co-housing site there are now a lot of schemes um, up and running and in development it's much more widely known i would think in the beginning you know we were just kind of a rather odd bunch of hippies wanting to do something a bit idealistic i think that's not the case now and so i think the climate has changed quite a lot and our credibility as a co-housing group is much stronger than it ever was and of course the political climate has changed significantly <laughs> is that the time thingy what, is that over or more or a minute to go <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. That was brilliant. Well timed. <laughs> really yeah, right. um, Alice Hemming. Uh, we have Alice next. Um, she's going to talk to us about Kindling Housing Co-op. Alice. Hi, um, I'm Alice. I'm, I'm actually going to talk to you about Dragonfly Housing Co-op, but I, I can also talk about Kindling. Um, I will just share my screen so you can see some pictures. Here we go. Can people can people see my pictures? Yes, great. Okay. Um, so my name's um Alice Hemming and um I live in a housing cooperative called Dragonfly. Um and there are two housing co-ops in the city of Oxford. One is called Dragonfly and, and one is called Kindling. Um, and Dragonfly was one of the first to be set up. Um, so it was actually set up, it's actually, in, it's in Florence Park. Um, and uh, it's a sort of semi-detached house that you can see here with the green windows. Um, and it was set up in 2000 by a group of environmental campaigners um, and activists. So they were doing that to be able to provide secure housing for themselves um, from which they can do their, their campaigning and their work in the community. Um, and so they were lucky really at the time because house prices were much lower in, in Florence Park. Um, they were supported by a network of, of housing co-ops, a national network called Radical Roots, and Radical Roots um, loans money to fully mutual housing co-ops to start up. So they received um, a loan from Radical Roots and then were able to take out a mortgage with Triodos. Um, we, have, we have just paid off our mortgage um, in December and we paid off our loan to Radical Roots a couple of years ago. So um, we fully own, up the COP fully own our house now, which is really exciting. So um, I mentioned it's a fully, um, fully mutual housing COP. That essentially means that as, mem as a member of the COP, you're both the tenant and the landlord. So we manage the, the house through the housing COP. And um, to become a member, all you need to do is apply and pay your one pound membership fee. And then um, my rent goes towards um, the upkeep of the house, paying off, paying off the mortgage when that was happening. Um, and generally um, keep it, yeah, keeping a pot of money to do maintenance on the house. And as a cooperative, we, we make decisions collectively. We set the rents collectively. Um, we're able to kind of manage um, what we do to the house and when and, and how and how we choose to fill our rooms. So we have four um, we have four rooms in our house. Um, there are four people living in Dragonfly at the moment. We decided over the lockdown to actually keep a room spare so that we could have a spare room. So we were really lucky that we were able to, um, in a time of kind of crisis, manage our finances ourselves and and provide sort of secure housing for everybody through quite a difficult time. So that that's um, yeah, that's a great thing about a cooperative, um, and so uh, also I mean I, I'll talk a bit about my own personal experience very very quickly. Um, I guess the 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 great thing about um, this as well is that uh, we have really cheap cheap rent compared to the rest of Oxford renters. So my rent um, is a, a 350 pound, 350 a month, which is, which is probably about half what a lot of people pay in shared houses. Um, and that's really supported me to be able to do, um, unpaid activism, to be able to take on, um, roles, um, part-time or, you know, around, around different community work that I do. So, um, this house really supports, supports the kind of community and the, the sort of wider, the wider, um, 
Oxford community, I guess, by by providing secure, affordable housing. Um, and it's enabled me to stay in, in a city where, where um, you know, I wouldn't be able to otherwise afford to buy my own house because I all, all I had to do to join the house is essentially pay a one pound share and pay my rent. So um, that's been that's been great. Um, I probably don't have that much time, but just to say we um, as, as sort of members, we we are our own landlords. So we kind of do all the maintenance on the house ourselves or DIY or we or we kind of um, take on um, contractors to do the work. So we essentially manage manage our, our finance finances um, and just uh, a few little quotes um, from two of my housemates um, just to kind of give you a bit of a flavour of what it's like to to kind of live in a housing cooperative and what it means to to us. Um, so so Caitlin who's here um, on the right says it's hard to put into words the feeling that knowing no matter how bad the world gets I'm living in a space where we look after each other and we can't get evicted this has been especially important after the year we've just had with Covid in a city like Oxford where the housing crisis is so acute it's impossible to live anywhere else and have agency about my housing situation this spurs me on to take care of the house and it's something that we're building for people in the future um, and so we, because we've paid off our mortgage, we, we're able to now remortgage our house and we're hoping in the next year to be able to set up a second housing co-op in Oxford. Um, and Lily, who's on the left here, says, um, I painted my wall yellow and it makes me happy every day. Um, having a secure and stable home has such an impact on my well-being. Um, housing co-ops are a fairer and democratic way of doing housing. A fair proportion of my income is spent on housing and I know that my money is how my money is being spent as we decide on it together and that's really empowering. Um, so yeah, I can stick around and answer any questions, but um, I just wanted to give you a more kind of personal flavour of, of, of what it would, what it's like to be living in a housing co-op. Thanks. Thank you very much, Alice. And uh, next we move on to Jenny Borden from Still Green Senior Co-Housing in Milton Keynes. Thank you, Fiona. So Still Green is at a really exciting stage at the moment. As you just said, we're in Milton Keynes. So we've moved from Oxford now to Milton Keynes and our scheme of 29 apartments and common spaces went in for planning permission in December. And we're hoping that it will be granted, planning permission will be granted in June or July and that building will start by the end of the year and we'll move in in 2023, the end of 2023. But to get to this stage has been a very long journey with a lot of the issues that people have already talked about today. Still Green started when a group of attenders at Milton Keynes Quaker meeting talked in 2009 about living more communally as they grew older. They then went on visits to a number of co-housing schemes in the Netherlands and to Spring Hill in Stroud and Lancaster here in the UK and spent a long time talking about what they really wanted. And from the beginning, Still Green decided that they wanted a co-housing scheme for people in the second half of life from 50 upwards. They wanted it to be mixed tenure where all could live well and as sustainably and eco friendly as they possibly could with good neighbours and staying active and independent for as long as possible. Still Green Incorporated as a community interest company in 2014 and we try to operate on a basis of mutual trust and respect and using as far as is possible a consensus form of decision making. It owes a lot to our Quaker beginnings. Those Quaker members are now in a minority. Since Still Green started, the central quest has been to find a site. And as you've heard from so, from so many others, finding a site is just so difficult. There have been three failed attempts. Each time we've lost money, we've lost time and effort, and most significantly, each time we lose members. And I suppose we were asked to talk about our lessons. 
that's one of our big lessons. Lots of time has been spent by people who have now left on defining the kind of community we wanted and the policies that we would have and our legal form and the criteria for the site. But we have only one member still from 2009 and four members from the first five years who are engaged and hope to move in. So a lot of the work that's already been done has to be done again and again by the people who will eventually live there. Finding a site and one that's financially viable is difficult and involves an enormous amount of compromise. All those must haves that early members spent hours arguing about just aren't possible. And so inevitably people get disillusioned and leave. And they leave because it takes too long and they leave because it takes too much energy. And their dream of what a co-housing scheme would be like just isn't financially viable. And in planning terms in the UK, it just doesn't seem to be possible here very easily. And so we're always marketing and looking for new members. Now we're working with the developer town who did Marmalade Lane in Cambridge. We are part of a wider regeneration scheme for Wolverton Town Centre called Love Wolverton. And Wolverton is an old railway town within Milton Keynes. And we'll have just one block in that development. It will be designed in a horseshoe with one and two bedroom mainly and a couple of three bedroom flats and a common house with a guest room, a laundry, kitchen, bike store, a nice south facing common garden and south facing terrace and so on. It will be part of the local microgrid. It'll have air heat source pumps. It'll be, have mechanic, mechanical ventilation and heat recovery. And hopefully it will be cross laminated timber if we can get the insurance issues to work out. Four of the flats in the planning application we've put in will be for social rent and the rest will be sold at market prices with an uplift to cover the common areas. And that's another lesson. Co-housing isn't cheap. About half of the apartments are now provisionally reserved. And so we're recruiting new members to join us in developing the project and to move in with us. There's still an awful lot to do, so it's a great time to get involved with us. But another of our challenges is to try to get a balance of different ages and types of households and to get some diversity. And we're a bit overbalanced with older single women right now. And so we're trying to address that whilst welcoming inquiries from anyone who really wants to live in a co-housing community. So I guess the biggest lesson from Still Green's experience is that persistence pays, that it takes a long time, that it needs a lot of compromise, but with perseverance, it is possible. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jenny. That was, that was really interesting. Um, and finally, and last but definitely not least, Helen Flitton from the Tame Community Land Trust. Helen. Thank you. Um, I think Tamara is going to um, share the slides for me. Thank you, Tamara. Okay, um, I'm Helen. From, uh, I'm a member of Tame Community Land Trust. Now, the origins of our land trust are slightly different to other CLTs you may have come across, as it was initially formed um, by members of our local town council. It's well known in and around Tame that house prices are appallingly high, and this was something the town council were hearing again and again from local people. So they decided to take matters into their own hands, and a handful of town councillors, along with residents of Tame, the people who work here, have joined together and we're all working to find ways of providing affordable homes for TAME. So <clears throat> I'm one of those local residents. Um, and I think our group demonstrates that there are different ways you can use the land trust model to build affordable homes in your area, like collaborating with town or parish councils. The aim of our CLT is to provide genuinely affordable housing for people with a strong connection to TAME. So this could be to help 
grown up children of families who have lived here for generations to stay in Tame, people who work in the town but travel long distances to get here, young couples, single parent families, um, no, there's a whole, there's a broad range of people who have been completely priced out of the market, but they all need to be here for a variety of social or economic reasons. <clears throat> there are huge gaps in housing provision in TAME that are not catered for by either local government or the home ownership market, and current market prices are unaffordable for ordinary working families on average incomes. What we hope to do is to provide homes using discounted market sales. So homes will be sold at around 30 to 40 percent below market value to households with a strong connection to TAME. And these homes will have a restrictive covenant to ensure they are resold at the same term. So you can't just buy a home on a discounted price and then immediately make a massive profit. Um, we're also forming a partnership with the Housing Association to provide socially rented homes, which work to the TAME CLT guidelines for eligible tenants. If we just move to the next slide, um, a call for sites was made through the council and luckily one site did come off in TAME, it's just marked in red there, um, <clears throat> which we currently have a planning application um, waiting for hopefully approval next month for uh, 31 affordable homes which was funded by a grant from Homes England. Um, Fiona at the Coho Hub is our project manager um, and has been working incredibly hard with the trust to keep the scheme moving forward. We've also engaged with a number of consultants to design the scheme, Transition by Design, who are speaking this week, are our architects. Um, before we submitted our planning application, uh, we sent a housing needs survey to around 5,000 households in TAME to identify people in housing need. And this was carried out through Community First Oxfordshire. Um, and we also hosted a public exhibition to show our plans to the local community and get opinions and thoughts. And it's partly through the exhibition that we now have around 150 people on our mailing list, many of whom are in immediate housing need. Um, but we also came across a lot of opposition to the trust and our aims. So that I would say, despite really good intentions of land trust and community led housing in general, not every member of your community will support you. And we've definitely seen this since we submitted the planning application. Um, I think that's partly down to messaging on our part and a lack of understanding from the public as to what community land trusts are and what we're trying to achieve and partly down to um, a very strong anti-development attitude in our area. So what we say to people who, for many different reasons, oppose the scheme or agree with our aims, but don't want more housing in TAME um, is okay. Then where? Because people need somewhere to live. Um, every single site around TAME that's been identified for housing in our local plan already has an options agreement in place with a big name house builder. And as a community group, we cannot compete with them in terms of price offered or resources available. Um, and I've realised I'm preaching to the converted here, but as you all know, land prices in this area are just too high. Um, <clears throat> our site is classed as a rural exception site, which means that house builder would never be allowed permission to build here. It's, be it's being considered by the district council purely because we're addressing a housing need and providing 100% affordable homes in perpetuity. This has an effect on the price of the land. And although in our eyes, it's still, it's still eye-wateringly expensive, it is significantly lower than full market value. And that gives us a fighting chance of actually being able to see this through. Um, as I mentioned, Transition by Design has helped us to design a beautiful scheme for the site. So if we just move on to the next um, slide. Um, as well as our key priority of providing affordable homes for TAME, the scheme incorporates three new pocket parks open to the public, an emphasis on pedestrian and cycle priority and homes designed to a very high environmental standard. We are in a climate emergency, so minimising the energy required to build and run the homes is key. And that ties in with our principles to provide homes that are not just affordable to purchase or rent, but also affordable to live in and run. 
So as well as aiming for passive house standards, um, we also have plans for air source heat pumps, solar panels and electric car charging for every home. I think what um, everyone who's spoken here today has demonstrated the variety of different tools communities can use to take positive action to tackle housing issues. And um, hopefully I've shown you that community land trusts are just one other route that is available to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, so we're actually bang on time. So well done to all the speakers. That was amazing. Um, and thank you all for an incredibly rich and diverse set of presentations. I think there were a lot of common themes there around, well, land really stood out, affordability, um, membership issues and, and design, good quality design really came through really strongly. Um, so we've got about uh, around about 20 minutes uh, for some questions and answers. Uh, we did get a few that were submitted before the session, so I might take some of those first, give Kay a chance to look at what's on the chat and for other people to add questions if they want to do that. Um, and I think what I might do is um, I might pick on people a little bit on the panel to answer some of the questions if that's okay with other people kind of chipping in. Um, but so one of the questions was from Sue Popper, who I think is on a call actually from uh, South Oxfordshire District Council, and she was interested in what what really got your group started. Some of you have talked about this, so I might pick on those that didn't talk about this so much. Um, but there was also an interesting sort of detailed question on that from Charlie Wright about going back to the very beginning. How did you in initially start to initiate discussions about forming a group? How did you reach out to other like-minded people? And I think I'm just going to come to Zareen first, actually, because Zareen's a very recent group. So it would be interesting to hear from her on, on that really early stage stuff in particular. I think by the time I came along, Fiona, and I found you through the hub here in my area and so on, they put me in touch. I think there were already a few people and then we had a couple of new people join us um, and we've held off widening it out further until we know, <laughs> have some more certainty with the land. Back to that one again, so, yeah. Thank you. Um, Helen, do you want to say a little bit about TAME and how you, you engaged the community early on, how, did, how you got together as a group? Um, yeah, well, as I, as I mentioned, it was um, actually local town councillors that had the initial idea to form the, the land trust and they put out a call to the um, wider community to ask people to join uh, and ask their opinions. Um, and that's where me and, uh, and a couple of other people decided that, well, this seems like a good idea. <laughs> I'd like to get involved, I'd like to help out. Um, uh, and, and we took it from there, really. But having the, the town council... Um, well, most of the town council supporting us and, and behind us has really helped um, keep the whole thing moving. It's helped with resources and knowledge of, um, uh, uh, of, the, of the system um, uh, and knowledge because they tend to get um, cues on when you're going on, on funding that's available. So, um, so that sort of technical knowledge has been has been really useful to the group. I think. Thank you. And um, Sarah, how about with a with a with your co-housing scheme? Can you say a little bit about where? Do, do you know much about the very beginnings of that? Well, Fran is better placed than me. Fran, Maybe Fran, yes, yeah, Fran. Fran. Beauty Land Trust, because she's the. My understanding is that she and a friend um, were very determined that there has to be an alternative house model, but you know, housing model. But Fran can say more. We um we just put a <clears throat> we put a note in Daily Info and we met in Quaker Meeting House and we had about twenty five people showing up to the first ever meeting, and um and then we just we've been meeting ever since. And um, what Sarah didn't say is that I think we are close to perhaps having a deal on some land, but you know, ten years it's not for the faint hearted. This stuff. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Thanks very much. Um. And then we've got another question that's coming from Charlie Fisher, who many of you will know. Um, and he's got a question, I'll just put this to the general panel with whoever's got ideas on this one really, but he's interested in why um, community-led housing seems to happen in some places in the Thames Valley and not others. Um, has, has anybody got 
anything they'd want to contribute to that? From any of the panel or Charlie? I think there's a sort of an irony that, that community housing probably happens where there's already community. Uh, and the irony is that the great thing about community housing is it, it my, my experience of, of, of visiting community housing projects is that it, it is the best way to get community is to have a community housing project where people are engaged in, uh, in, in building the places where they're going to live. So I suspect it happens where you have a strong community group. I mean, that's certainly the case in Hook Norton. Hook Norton's got a very strong community, I think partly because it's a village without roads through it. It has a certain size, like Tame, a bit smaller than Tame, obviously, but there's a certain critical mass. And I think you also just get a bit of serendipity where you get a few busybodies and, you know, people who are interested in getting involved. Uh, I can see many of those kind of people on this call who are prepared to, you know, put in the hard yards to make it happen. And then, you know, it's a really hard alchemy. And I think that's the big challenge we've got. And, and actually what's interesting is the government are actually doing a, a big investigation into self-build at the moment. Uh, Richard Bacon MP is leading that uh, investigation. And, and one of the things that I was talking to him about it and saying, you need to create a support network for places where there aren't these communities, because often these are the people that could really benefit from these kind of projects, as well as all the other hurdles we've heard about um, uh, of land cost and financing. But, uh, but I do think it's that sort of like, it's that, that initial spark. And I think what we'll find is that when we get more success stories, which I am absolutely sure we will over the next few years, that you, the, the, their momentum will build. But I think it's just understanding the art of the possible is challenging for some people. Thanks. No, I think that's um, that's right. Um, anybody, any of the other panel want to contribute anything to that question? Not at the moment, that's fine. Um, and then finally, just from the ones I've had, and then we'll go to some of the ones in the chat. Uh, Rihanna Reese, who's actually a member at Still Green, um, is just asking all the panellists really what experience they have of partnerships with registered providers. Um, when they're trying to provide the social and affordable housing. Um, so I, I don't know who wants to start on that, really. Possibly um, Helen, yeah. yeah so ours is about what letting you know for you. It's been a little bit patchy. Um, we, we spoke to a number of registered providers um, to, to find someone to go into partnership with. Some um, have been well we thought we're very interested and we thought we were going to go into partnership with them and then pulled out at the last minute now we're talking to others um so i think we, what we struggled with if it's not a very big site and there aren't lots of houses there then um you know they and, and uh, it's it's sort of making it worth a while if um, you know what i mean um but it's um it, it's also about their control over it because sometimes they don't necessarily want to enter into um uh our guidelines of who is going to live in these houses i suppose that's more really to do with the district council um uh than the housing uh, than the housing associations but um but yeah it's not it's not been an easy process to um to find someone to go into partnership with and agree the terms that meet our community land trusts um, key principles. We, we, in, in, we've got an interesting sort of side issue. I think I agree with what Helen said. We've got an interesting side issue in our project, which is that the houses will be passive plus. Um, so the running costs will be next to nothing. But the problem we've got, and this is, a, this is a problem that is sort of baked into the entire housing and rental uh, property market is that there is a disconnect between the builder and the renter in many cases. So we, we can get affordable rents, but then it costs us a lot more to build the houses and we can't charge any more for the houses, even though the running costs are gonna be lower. So there needs to be a basket of rent and average running costs so that it allows the builders, the developer, you lot, the community developer, that's what we are. That's not, you know, that's what we are as community led development. To, to actually invest more money to build the housing. And, you know, I've been sitting here staring at our spreadsheets trying to get the prices to stack up all day. And, and part of the problem is we can't charge any more rent, but we know they'll be paying so much less in their running costs. How you crack that one, I don't know. I'm looking for Fiona to sort it out for us, but uh, <laughs> it's a very widespread problem, which I'm sure many of you, when you get further down your journeys, you realize why developers build the kind of crud that they do, it's because they've got no vested interest in getting your running bills down. Because let, let me comment on that, please. Can I? Yeah. That means yes. 
I put a note in the chat about Exeter City Council, probably eight years ago, were laughed at when they said we want to build passive house social housing and everybody said it's going to cost you more. They went ahead and did it. It did cost more for the first round of social housing. The second round of social housing cost exactly the same as it cost for normal building regulations, but they built a passive house standard. All their tenants love it. And so there's no additional cost on passive house if you do it right. You need to set up a passive house procurement framework. You need to decide that's what you're doing and then follow what Exeter did. And you've got it cracked so you don't have to charge more rent and the tenants are going to love it. So it's, it's a win-win. Everybody wins. Thank you. Um, Fran, I, I guess you're the other one who's gone a fair way down the route with uh, with talking to registered provider. I wonder if you could say a bit about your your conversations with. Yeah, so Oxford Community Land Trust um, has spoken over the years to probably all the local providers, and we came close with Green Square when we were doing when we were had the first round of trying to build the Dean Court project, and then of course the project collapsed and it didn't happen. And then I think Green Square, who had been involved because they were involved involved in um, the Stroud build and I think they've you know they've not Spring Hill but the other one um, what's it the called? Triangle was it wasn't they not the triangle um, Cash's green. 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 Yeah. green yeah so that I think they've slightly withdrawn from it anyway um, the long and the short of it is we we, we are talking to one of the local um, ha um, housing associations about post occupancy management because we don't want to do that and there's definitely one that's up for that and they look they're a good fit in terms of their value set with us and um, but I can't say who they are because we actually haven't done the deal yet um, but the other thing is that um, Oxfordshire Community Land Trust um, the grant funding that it's received recently is subject to our becoming a registered provider so we've spent a, a long time going through the application process for that and we're now you know in the second stage where we're having to provide lots of additional evidence and we're hoping that that will come through within six months, which means we will then be able to draw down our funding, which is subject to that registration. So we will become an RP, but that doesn't solve all of the issues because you know we still don't want to do the post-occupancy management because we're simply not set up to do it. So several different things that RPs can help with, but um, we, you know, the, the particular bit that we were seeking help with, um, we will be able to get help. That's the post occupancy management. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I think that's a, that's a really good point in the, you know, the way particularly capital funding for affordable housing, as well as the management now is very uh, predetermined by you becoming an RP or working with an RP. So it's yes. becoming more yeah. and more critical. Yeah, and we're quite concerned about some of the strings that might be attached to that because we, um, most land trusts are really into permanent affordability and we are concerned that some of that could be eroded by the you know government requirements when you're in receipt of mm. um, home office um sorry when you're in receipt of government funding mm. if they do it does come with strings and yes. so we are quite concerned about that yeah, thank yeah. You. I, I think I'd agree with that you know from the discussions we've had with the RPs, they've got their way of doing things. They've got their model for how they get from A to B. Um, and we've got a slightly different route to that. And it's getting them to think outside of their current way of doing things. So it's been a struggle uh, and getting them to understand what we're doing um, and coming along with it has been quite hard. And I guess I, I'm hoping that there are, you know, there's three community land trusts very close to Oxford, you know, Hook Norton, TAME and Oxford Community Land Trust and perhaps there will eventually be if we have sufficient in our portfolios we may in fact be able to do something ourselves you know and but you know we're not nowhere near that yet but I would hope that the Community Land Trust movement will grow to the point where it will be able to have its own um, you know its own kind of ways of doing things and be more in control of that. I also think that point picks up to what Tony was saying about Exeter and I put a little note in the chat that we've, we've spoken to Exeter Council and A, it's been a very long process to get towards that affordability and a lot of it is to do with the fact they're delivering those schemes at quite a large scale and I think this drives exactly to your point Fran that 
if we can share that learning over a number of community land trusts, yes, there is a chance and develop a sort of kit that you reproduce. Yes, there is a chance of getting it down to developer their prices. But if you're trying to deliver high quality shared spaces with great design at developer led prices and passive house, it is very hard to build it if you can only go to a flat rent without you know, somehow clawing back that additional saving that, that the people have living there. And I think that comes down to how you then manage it. And I think there has to be some joined up thinking between these programs mm. or, or these projects, or it just becomes reinventing the wheel and the same mistakes being made again and again, and we don't get a developed enough system. I mean, it's obviously slightly uh, ambitious and probably a little um, naive and, 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 and optimistic, but if we could get much better op uh, communication and cooperation, I suspect it would be for benefit for all. Mm. Yeah, hopefully the, the, the hub can contribute to that. That's certainly yeah, one, one of our ambitions. Um, Kay, is there anything that you would pick up from questions in the chat? Um, that, and there's some of there's been some backwards and forwards going on. Yeah, yeah a lot has been talked about. I mean, the, the overriding one is funding. I think the funding, how to acquire the land as well, how to how to find land that is affordable with the funding that's available seems to be the overarching one that all groups seem to have a problem with to a certain extent, although the co-housing have that different model of financing their, their, their it's a smaller scale scheme as well. But then, um, so that the funding and land acquisition is the big one. Stigma is um, something that came up. Um, the, 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 what Charlie mentioned earlier about people wanting to be on the housing list or rather not wanting to be on the housing list, but it helps if they are on the housing list. And that comes into play, especially when we are looking with, at, as community land trusts, if we do have to get together with registered providers, then that element will actually become quite a key feature. The, the being on the housing list could be quite instrumental of providing affordable housing with registered providers as a community land trust. And, but then we have to look at um, housing allocations. So that might be something that uh, will come up. But certainly that stigma around affordable housing and rented housing, that concept of um, renting not, is not owning. And so there's a lot of things, kind of these classic thoughts of around housing and owning your own home, whether that needs to change. Maybe that came up in the chat a bit. Uh, other things that came up. Um, the affordability, I think we've spoken about. One point was mentioned about self-build and custom build and the difference between that and how that fits into the different platforms that we've been talking about today. So we've been talking about today about community land trusts, co-housing, where people come together and live together, or, or co-ops where people kind of live in a smaller scale of a house on that scale. Um, but then the self-build and custom build is another bolt on that kind of can touch on all of those platforms that we've been looking at today. And uh, that is actually something that we will be talking about on Thursday, specifically the difference between um, how that might feed into community-led housing as well. So those questions that came into the chat, maybe we can answer those on Thursday more precisely. Um, that's kind of an overview of the questions that came through the chat. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, land and funding, I think, I think we've covered reasonably well um mainly the problems um but uh, as Kay said there's definitely Thursday's sessions well worth thinking about um attending in terms of land I'm trying I can see I just would just like to um go to Zareen just quickly if you don't mind just because I know you've been doing some work around sites and I thought it'd be quite interesting to hear from you around land Zareen as well That's Oh, you're still muted, Serene, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, you <laughs> <laughs> Shall I come back to you? You're right. Shall I come back to you? Fran, should we... Oh, there we are. There we are. <laughs> I, I feel uh, very ill-informed to speak about the land because one of our members has been doing a lot of intelligence gathering on that. They're not here uh, to. They're they not, not here. No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I know, interestingly, that that um, you have you have been looking 
closely at the self-build allocation as yes. part of strategic sites, which I think is one new and interesting route through for land. Um, Fran, I'm sorry, you were going to come in here as well, I think. One thing I want, I meant to say at the end of my little presentation was that one of the things I felt we really needed to do as a community led housing movement was to press for change in legislation where charities and the public sector have to sell their land to the highest bidder. And th this has been on all of our agendas for forever, but honestly, the la most of the land that's available now is, is public sector land or, mm -hmm. or charity land and all of the ones that we've lost out on. Um, thus far have for one reason or another been connected with that particular problem and there needs to be a way in law where other things other than financial value can be taken into account mm -hmm. you know social value environmental value the whole triple bottom line if, if we could actually use that as part of negotiating land deals we might stand a better chance of extracting some public sector land for community-led housing or charitable land. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And, and interestingly, they've just uh, released the Brownfield Land Release Fund, uh, specifically looking at trying to enable public authorities to release their land. Um, and some of that is for self and custom build, but you're absolutely right, Fran, that, that, that needs to include some sort of social value within that to enable community groups to really be able to competitively bid for those projects, I think. So thank you very much. Um, can I just add a little bit about the financing? Yes, yes. yes. Um, there are financing problems at every level and every stage in this process. You know, there, there are the initial problems of finding the site and financing all of that and raising the money and so on. But even when you get to the stage of, with an enabling developer um, of actually the members buying their properties, it is a form of custom build and therefore you are you know, probably going to have to make staged payments along the way. And particularly when you're looking at older people, you know, they need to sell their house in order to have the money to do that. You know, if they sell it, where do they live? These days where interest rates, you know, are next to nothing, they're not going to have anything like enough to rent. You know, timetables are very uncertain. There are very few mortgage companies who are interested in providing mortgages for those different kinds of buying processes or even for co-housing products where there's a covenant about how you can sell and you can't immediately sell onto the open market and so on. So there are a whole tangle of issues here that you know one is dealing with all the way along the process yeah that is where i think we as a hub as a community collaborative housing hub i think and the reason for this conference is to have these conversations and to actually because at the moment people are talking having to deal with these things in their on their own turf but actually what we can see here is that in the thames valley we have a few people doing things and, and have been doing things for some time that we need these conversations and these platforms to kind of find that that knowledge and, and share that so that the next people don't have to repeat everything and we move to another level maybe so I'm hoping with, the, with the, this conference and everybody here we can um, perhaps find more positive solutions as well obviously it's still a long journey <laughs> but, um, um, is there anything else anybody would like to raise on any of those issues, really, particularly around, um, you know, those, the, the land and the funding and the stigma? Is there, is there anything any, anybody, doesn't have to be a panel member, anybody would like to say? Uh, Daniel, come to you. I get so depressed listening to my friends spending their life doing this. Um, it has to be systematised. It has to be. You can't have all these individual battles taking 20 years in the case of the older women's housing co-op. You know, my friends can't afford their own relationships and their own lives to fight these battles. And we've got a system and it's called the planning system. And quite simply, if you had an allocation which was dedicated to this form of housing and you have people like James Brokenshire and Alex Sharma who put their names to support the community-led housing. 
it's a public interest issue which the planning system could deliver on. That it, you can fight all your individual battles, but as you do that, you really have to lobby for systemic change. Now there is a systemic change, and that is the self and custom building. So that was another very frustrated sector. And thanks to Richard Bacon MP, it was elevated. And the current Secretary of State says 40,000 houses could be delivered in that way. No, it won't. So I would suggest if there's already a broken system, which was the self and custom build one, that you hijack it and get together to collaborate. So both sectors can advance because you can create your own system, your own act, your own planning and housing act if you like. But I think it'd be better if you cooperated. Um, uh, Richard Bacon, he started the thing off, but the fact is it hasn't succeeded. And like, to rely on him again, which the government is, I don't think it's going to work. So you need to find a champion who gets on with Richard and they go to the all party parliamentary group, you go to select committees, and in the end, you get Mr. Pincher and Mr. Jenrick to understand that this is a really important public interest because you're the public. All you speak is good sense. All you speak is stuff that is a genuine pub wider public interest and it should happen. And the planning system is there waiting to help you if you can only get top down influence and change. Sorry about the, the rant, but no, it's really frustrating listening to my friends yeah for the last 10 years, knocking their head against this one. Yeah, I mean, there is there is a huge amount of work going on clearly at national level, both from the uh, Right to Build Task Force, NAXPA, um, and the various community-led housing groups, um, national groups in particular around this. Um, but it does, does seem to be such a slow <laughs> drip by drip, um, you know, and as you say, isn't making the systemic change that's needed. I should just point out we've got uh, five minutes. So. Yeah, so I think we will wrap up. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, I think we'll we will wrap up. Thank you, thank you um, again for all those questions. I think it's been uh, yeah really a really good conversation actually, and quite a few things that I hope that we'll take forward um, into the rest of the festival. Um, I'd like to, two things I'd like to say really, one is if you would like to get in touch with the, um, with the hub afterwards, if you, if you're, you know, this has inspired you to um, take a, a, a closer look at community-led housing, whether you're somebody who wants to do it or whether um, you are somebody who might partner with a community-led housing group, a local authority, a developer, an enabling developer, a housing association, we'd really love to hear from you. And, uh, probably the best way, we'll send details out after the sessions, of course, but you can also contact us at any time uh, through our website, uh, collaboratorhousing.org, so please get in touch. Um, I'd like to also say we've got uh, a, looking to be a really fascinating session tomorrow uh, called Justice in Community-Led Housing, which will consider how marginalised communities are often locked out of housing solutions, but also looking at some groups from those communities that have really pioneered some really inspirational projects. So if you can come along to that, it's on at the same time, five o'clock till 6.30 tomorrow evening. We'd love to see you there. Um, so beyond that, it's really just for me to say once again, just a huge thank you, um, particularly to all our speakers who really did a very difficult job of fit, fitting a lot of information into a very, very tight time scale. So, so thank you. Um, you are inspirational, believe me, you are. Um, and also especially to Charlie Laxton for both presenting the Hook Norton project, but also for for really um, setting the tone for the festival and kicking us off. So, and thank you all for coming. It's been really great to see so many of you on the call. You've made it. Thank you and, and goodbye. <laughs>